Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very special episode of Take One. Today, I am joined by Sam Green, a New York-based documentary filmmaker who directed The Weather Underground, which was nominated for Best Documentary Feature Film at the Academy Awards. That said, he is best known for pushing the boundaries of documentary filmmaking by creating in-person theatrical experiences known as live documentaries. His most recent live documentary, 32 Sounds, will be performed on the 5th of October at this year's Vancouver International Film Festival. Sam, thank you for joining us today. Glad to be here. Hell yeah. And the first thing I'll say is congratulations. I absolutely loved 32 Sounds. I honestly feel that calling 32 Sounds a documentary feels like a disservice to the sensory experience that it actually is. I loved it. I have never watched a film that engages with my sense of hearing like this one does. I've <laughs> never watched a movie that is this interactive. You know, I've never seen a film that has asked me to close my eyes, shout, and break into dance in the middle of the <laughs> film. But it is also a very profound and moving experience. So once again, congratulations. Thank you for saying all that, and I'm happy that the movie did something to you. Oh, it, it did many things to me. But uh, okay, let's jump right into the first question, yeah. which is, you know, ever since I heard about you and about your work, I've been fascinated by this idea of live documentaries. And that brings me to my first question, which is, what is a live documentary? Uh, the question I've struggled with for the past 10 years. Um, it's my pithy answer to that is it's, it's a having an event where I narrate in person on a stage, a band or musicians do the soundtrack live and the film screens. So it's all the elements of a movie. It just happens live, which sometimes people are still like, what? You know, and I have to sort of explain in more detail, but your audience, I think is very smart and that's enough. I hope. Hell yeah. Yeah, okay. that's perfect. Uh, now the second question is what yeah. inspired you to start making this live documentaries? It's a good question, and it's a long story, which I'll make short, but I was um, I was editing a movie, and it was a kind of experimental movie about utopia, and I was very stuck with it. I, I showed people a rough cut, you know, when you're sort of half done and you're editing, and everybody said, this makes no sense. Like, I, I don't understand this movie at all, and I was completely crestfallen and didn't know what to do, and in that moment, somebody wrote me and said, hey, would you give a talk about your film project? And I said, sure, I'll show some pieces of video and I'll talk and I'll, it sounds really boring, so I'll have a friend do live music. So it's like a fancy lecture. And the person said, sure. So I did that. I, I talked about the project and showed clips and he made live music and it really worked. It was everything I wanted the film to do. And I kind of filed that away and then a film festival said, hey, would you come do that talk at our film festival? And I said, sure. And I made it even fancier. And then it worked again, just like I wanted the movie to. And so then I sort of thought, well, I've never heard of this form, but I am a big believer in the the material dictates the form yeah. and uh, or should. And so I thought, well, you know, I've never heard of a live documentary, but I'll I'll try it. And I somehow submitted it to Sundance and they showed it. And so I thought, this is cool. I'll do one show and, you know, go back to making movies. But after that, all over the world, people said, will you come do your live documentary? And I had so much fun. I've never been in a band. By that point, I had three musicians and I've never been in a band, but it was really fun. We traveled around. It was like being in a band. And also, it was right around the time when people started to watch movies on their computers at home while checking email. You know, which I do, but I just thought this is a terrible way to experience cinema, especially a movie about utopia, which was what that movie was about. Um, you know, utopia is always about a collective experience, and you're telling me people are going to be at home checking email watching this? It's like not not good. So this live form seemed to fit, and after that, I just really liked the form. It became interesting to me. There's so much potential. There's such powerful tools to have a huge image and big music and people turn off their phones, you really got them, you know, it's it's like cinema at its most powerful. So I really just, I've kept coming back to it. I think I've made four or five of these because I just like the, the potential of the form a lot and figuring out how to use it to its fullest. Oh yeah, well, I love them, so definitely keep them coming. <laughs> Uh, but I think I know the answer to my next questions, but I'll, I'll ask it just in case. And my next question is, 
Will your live documentaries ever become available through streaming services, physical media, or video on demand? And if the answer is no, which I suspect, uh, why is that the case? That's a great question. And until now, I said no, just because there was something about... So I did I did a live documentary that actually screened in Vancouver about seven years ago about a guy named Buckminster Fuller. And he was like an inventor and futurist. And I did that with a band called Yola Tango. It was an indie band and lots of people love that band. And one of the things I realized with that is like when they walk into the hall, the venue, when they come out on stage, you can feel there's like a gasp in the audience. People love bands. People love bands way more than they ever love filmmakers. <laughs> no. So it became interesting to me. That piece worked in large part because they were there in the room. If they're just making the score, it's a different experience. You're just, it's a normal movie with a, you know, you don't get too excited if Johnny Greenwood, I mean, I love him. That's not a good example. But if Yola Tango does the score for a movie, it's cool. But if they're in the room with you, it's super cool. So I made a film about the Kronos Quartet and they play the soundtrack. Same thing. But this new movie, 32 Sounds, I've actually also made as a regular movie. And sometimes it shows as a regular movie in a movie theater. I'm not there and it works. It's the first time I made something that works in both arenas. So that one is a regular movie and eventually will be on iTunes and all that. So. Hell yeah. I'm Question. happy to hear that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Lovely. Yeah, I'm, I'm so I'm so excited because, you know, I've been telling my family and friends like, hey, I just watched this incredible live documentary. And it's uh -huh. a shame because I don't know if you'll ever be able to watch it. But if you right, do, well, make them, you should. Make them go to the show, at least in Vancouver. <laughs> For sure. I mean, right. I'm, I'm sure it's going to be a bit difficult considering that most of my family lives in Colombia, but I'll try. Ah, all right. <laughs> well, let's just send them the link. <laughs> oh hell yeah well, you know down the line when it's in itunes i'll tell them to okay. buy it uh but anyways you know that brings me to my next question which is you know as we've been saying your most recent live documentary is called 32 sounds yeah can you tell us a bit about 32 sounds you know what yeah, is 30... this project and what makes it so special 32 sounds is i mean it's hard to answer that question but i mean the the short answer is it's a documentary all about sound and sort of the mysterious and powerful nature of sound, how sound can bring us back in time to other people and places, can remind us of things, can move us in odd ways. So I'm totally intrigued with sound and how it works. And so I, I, I really was inspired to make the movie for that reason. Sound is endlessly fascinating to me. So that's sort of a, a description, but it uses, you know, a sound is so vast, you could make eight million movies you could make a 10 hour movie about sound so with this movie i use this sort of structuring device which is 32 different sounds it's sort of essay about sound built around 32 specific recordings of things and it's an eclectic mix ranging from the foghorns of san francisco to uh the sound of a whoopee cushion to you know cicadas um all sorts of things it's a wide range Hell yeah. Uh, now, I watched 32 Sounds via screener link alone yeah. in my room. Uh, yep. You know, I was aware that those who were going to be watching it on the 5th of October at VIF would be watching yeah. it with headphones. So I did the same. You know, I, I wore this headphones to watch the documentary. And I'm glad I did because the spatial sound completely blew me away. Yeah. It generally felt like someone was lighting on matchsticks inside yeah. my room, which was weird. Yeah, uh, but then yeah, definitely watching it via screener link alone in my room was definitely an interesting experience. You know, yeah. Even though there was no one around me to peer pressure me into doing the things that yeah. the documentary was asking me to do, I still closed my eyes. I uh -huh. still moved my body, and I even shouted at two a.m. in the morning, which That's led great. to my very concerned roommate coming <laughs> into my room, being like, "What the hell just happened?" <laughs> and then me being like, "No, no, no! I'm watching art. I'm watching a documentary. You wouldn't get it." That's great. <laughs> But uh, anyway, all of that got me thinking, and that brings me to my next question, which is, what would you say are some of the key differences, you know, some of the things I miss yeah. by not watching it live? Funny, in some ways, I feel like the movie works best in two different ways, in its live form or the way you experienced it at home alone. There's a kind of freedom, and it's interesting because when you're in a movie theater with other people, 
you're part of a collective. There's a kind of the magic of cinema. You're part of this collective experience and you, you go somewhere with other people. It's weird. There are no other avenues of our life or places in our life where we sit next to a stranger and have a profound experience. So there's some magic of that. But then there's also, I think, a real magic of being alone at home with your headphones. You're totally, you know, in a way, you're you're more alone there than you'll ever be. And that's a powerful place to experience something. So I, I don't actually think it's a diminished version what you saw. I think it's a different version and it traffics in different kind of magic. But, you know... I like both of them. I think they're both good. The fact that you, you know, at, at home, you're free in a way. The fact that you could do all that. In a theater, it's sometimes harder to get people to do it because you're around people. But when you wear headphones, you're sort of oddly oblivious to other people. We're all wearing headphones like nobody can hear me or see me, which is kind of interesting too. Room. No, I mean, great answer. I'm, I'm happy to hear I didn't watch an inferior version. No, not um, at all. Which I, I didn't feel like I did because I absolutely loved it. Yeah. But um, anyway, that brings me to my next question, which is, you know, there's a part of the film where you talk about how tangled up sound and cinema are. And yeah. you mentioned sound designer Randy Tom, who said, and I quote, sound is a second class citizen in our consciousness, but it has a secret weapon, stealth. Sound sneaks in the side door of our brains, often completely unnoticed. It works on us as if by magic. And, you know, in that moment where you're talking about Randy Tom and you're sharing this quote, a scene from The Shining is playing in the background. You know, the scene of Danny Torrance in his tricycle speeding through the floors of the Overlook Hotel. And, you know, before we see the scene, the screen is just completely black. You know, we, we're just listening to the sound. You know, we're listening to the sound of the wheels of the tricycle rolling on the wooden floor, then on the carpet, then on the wooden floor, then on the carpet once again. And when I watched your documentary for the first time, I had no idea what the sound was from. But yet... As soon as I heard it, I instantly felt unease. I instantly felt kind of scared. And then when I saw the image, you know, everything made perfect sense. And I'm like, <laughs> of course I'm scared. This is The Shining, you know, the movie that yeah. freaked me out when I was a child. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to say that first, I love that moment in your documentary uh, because hey. you undeniably proved the truthfulness of Randy <laughs> Tom's words. Like you, you literally showed me how sound sneakily snuck into my brain and triggered a memory and yeah. a feeling without me even knowing as of well, by magic. Also, more than that, I've looked at that scene many times and I've never understood why it's so unnerving. And it, there's this weird, for people who don't remember it, and you mentioned it, it's, it's the, the kid from The Shining riding through this hotel on a big wheel and he, the sound is this interesting thing where he's going over wood and it's like, and then he's going over carpet and goes do, 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 and it goes back and forth and there's nothing on the face of it that should be scary yet somehow that sound is profoundly unnerving and all I can say is it, it's some weird magic you know it really is so I like that you got it a lot of times people will say like was that your kid or something you know and it's like, <laughs> oh, you missed that you got to go see the shining you know so <laughs> Definitely. No, I, I definitely adored it. And that brings me to my next question, which is, yeah. what advice would you give to young filmmakers who are tackling sound in their films for the first time? Ah, wow. Well, it's interesting because, you know, I do documentary film. And one of the things that making this film really drove home to me is the documentary, and I say this lovingly because I love documentary, but documentary is pretty rudimentary in terms of sound. In some ways, it's it's in the 20th century still. And, you know, you probably know this, you're a young person, but VR and gaming are way ahead of documentary and actually fiction film too in terms of sound. And the reason for that is people wear headphones and you can do so much with headphones that you can't do with speakers, binaural sound, ambisonic sound. And so I think documentary and to a lesser extent fiction film is held back by the fact that everybody's making things for a theater which is basically like maybe stereo or surround sound but most documentaries are not even surround sound so it really made me realize in making something that really uses sound in a sophisticated way that wow documentaries got a lot of room 
lot of ground to cover to catch up. Um, but if for, I guess for advice, cause that was the question you asked, just look at other, other fields and see how they're using sound and try to incorporate some of that because people are using sound in amazing ways. You know, there's one of the things I like pointing out is that you can go to the worst piece of shit Hollywood movie and the sound is great. There's no movie you'll see like that where the sound is bad. They're always paying millions of dollars to total pros to do a great sound design and sound mix. So, you know, there's amazing film sound is so incredible. And like you go see like Dune in in, you know, Dolby Atmos, that's like being in a mosh pit or something. You know, it's really a profound experience. I did do that myself because Mark Mangini, who's the sound designer for 32 Sounds, did Dune. He actually did Dune right before he did 32 Sounds, which I think is shows what a cool guy he is. But he, you know, I boggled my mind that somebody could have their have in their head that much sound, that much sound design. You know, like I imagine him being like the 27th track on the 45th explosion in the 95th scene was a little loud. You know, like, how do you keep track of that? That's amazing. Th thank you for the advice. Great yeah. advice. I'll definitely keep it in mind when I'm, you know, scoring my <laughs> next short film, I guess. It won't play in theaters, but I'll keep it yeah. in mind. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, that brings me to my next question, which is, one of my favorite moments in your entire documentary, you know, probably my favorite moment is, you know, the part when you're asking Cheryl Tip, who is the curator yeah. of natural science at the British Library Sound Archive, you know, mm. when you ask her for the most striking sound she has ever heard. And, you know, her answer is a recording of the last ever Moho Brocatus, which yeah. is a now extinct bird that used to live in the islands of Hawaii. You know, yeah. a recording of the last ever Moho Brocatus calling out to his partner, unaware that his partner was already dead and that he was the last of his species. Yeah. First of all, incredible scene. You know, in, in my letterbox review that I wrote for 32 Sounds, I literally wrote, who would have thought that a blank screen and the mating call of a bird would have come together to create one of the most profound and moving scenes I have ever witnessed. So <laughs> I was blown away. And that brings me to my next question, which is, you know, I would like to ask you the same question that you asked, uh, you know, that I, I would like to ask you the same I question that you asked Cheryl Tip. What is the most striking and arresting sound you have ever heard? Wow. It's funny because I, you know, sometimes people will say like, what's your favorite documentary? And I always feel like I'm failing the test because I never have like one favorite, you know, documentary. There's a lot of documentaries I like and depending on the day, I'll remember this or that one. But it's sort of the same with favorite sound. I don't know. I mean, one of the reasons why one of the main characters in the film is a woman named Anaya Lockwood who's an old kind of sound artist and musician. And I, I learned about her when I read in a book a reference to her. It said, Anaya Lockwood, who's recorded the sound of rivers for 50 years. And that really intrigued me. I was thought to myself, who is this person? Because I love the sound of rivers. I love the sound of water. And I love the sound of rivers, especially. And she has made all these records that are sound maps of different rivers. And it sounds like maybe that's dumb. It's just like one recording of the river, but she goes all down the river recording different things. And it's a collage of things. So sometimes, you know, she did the Hudson River, the Danube River, and sometimes it's, it's gurgling, you know, sometimes it's rapids. There's a million different sounds to a river. And all mic'd very close, so it's beautiful sound, and it's just such a such an incredible, soothing, rich, sonically dense and complex, delightful sound. It's a it's a a deeply pleasing sound to me, at least. So that's a great sound. But then there's all sorts of ones like I love the sound of a dial telephone. You know, that's an old sound. You're too young for that, but older people know that sound from their teenage years. I like the sound of geese, migrating geese when they fly over and they honk. That sound is a great sound. I could go on and on and on. What is What sounds do you like, Juan? That's a beautiful answer, first of all. Uh, and uh, 
yeah, you know, when when I came up with these questions, I, 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 I was also thinking of myself, you know, mm, what would I say is my favorite sound? Yeah. And I guess I would have to say, you know, back home in Colombia, we have this trees called manglares, which I think the translation in English is mangroves, but it's basically this, you know, beautiful trees with super long roots that yeah. grow out of the water, like, yeah. you know, right by the beach, you know, right yeah. by the sea. And the special thing about manglares and this manglar forest is that, you know, the roots are so intertwined that like only little species can go into the trees. So essentially, you know, a bunch of little species and little animals and, you know, little bugs and fish go into the manglares in order to hatch their babies. Yeah. So these manglares essentially become like nursery homes for sea life and ocean life. So, you know, whenever me and my family, whenever we go to the Caribbean Sea and we go to it, one of these manglar rainforests, it's, it's always a special experience to, you know, submerge my head. A lot of sound. Oh, it, it sounds like everything and nothing at the same time it, it it sounds like eclosions and weird little popping noises and like <laughs> gurgling and screaming and it's it's you know i remember when i was very young uh, i went there with my grandma and i asked her what is that like i, I went under <laughs> what i was like what the hell am i listening to and i think she said life you know very very poetic <laughs> wise grandma it's a thing to That's say great. but uh, it it has stuck with me, and um, I think to I'm this day that I'm gonna go online and look. I'll see if I can find something about that. I hope you can, and if you can't, you know, this December when I go back, I'll I'll try to make a recording <laughs> and I'll, right. I'll I'll send it to you somehow. Cool. But uh, anyway, I, I I think we've already talked about what my next question is gonna be. But yeah. uh, you know, just in case, throughout the film, you also place particular importance on the relationship between sound and memory. You know, the fact that sound that you hear in the present can instantly trigger a memory of something that yeah. happened in the past. So my question is, excluding music, what is a sound in, what is a sound that is particularly nostalgic to you? You know, a sound that instantly evokes a strong memory from your past. Well, it said the dial telephone, but there's also other for there are a lot of sounds I tried to work into 32 sounds that just for one reason or another didn't work. And one of them was a series of extinct sounds. And so it was the dial telephone, the fax machine and the dial-up modem. All of these are things that, like, if you're a certain age, you remember fax machines made a specific noise, and all those are deeply... Um, another one is the end of a record player, when it the record gets the end, and it kind of makes this funny repeating sound. So that's... that's Then there's... Well, music, you said no music. Um, uh, snow... I grew up in Michigan, and snow, like, the kind of... It's in the film, the sound of snow falling, and that sa that sound, it's almost like a sonic environment. It's more like a feeling, actually, when there's a big snow at night, everything is still and quiet in this way that it never is in the summer. You know, in the summer, there's insects and birds, and but also the snow muffles sound, so everything is very quiet. There's a kind of quiet that comes with snow that really brings me back. Also, I grew up in a college town. Now you're really getting me going. I grew up in a college town. And on Saturday mornings, there would be football games at the stadium, which is maybe was maybe like two miles from my house. But I would hear like the wafting of like a marching band and also like a, an announcer over loudspeakers. You know, you couldn't hear the words, but you could hear like, you know, just sort of this hint of a loudspeaker and sometimes a marching band and it just it's like oh it's fall and the college football games happening so i'm sure everybody has similar things that even telling it you can see my face kind of changes i i feel you know memory is sound and memory is so weird you don't even need the sound you just remember the sound and then it brings it all back you definitely paint a beautiful picture. <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. But um, okay, I guess uh, moving on. Um, yeah. The next thing I will say is, you know, in my opinion, one of the most fascinating ideas that are tackled throughout 32 Sounds is the idea of sound as a way to stop death, you know, a way to yeah. keep people alive. Uh, throughout the film, you allude to some old tapes that you own, and these yep. tapes, which you refer to as old ghosts, yeah. contain voice recordings of people that were once close to you but who now are dead. Yeah. Um, at first, you refused to listen to the tapes because you feared that you would get used to them and that the magical thing where the tape actually holds a person would wear off. Then that said, you know, eventually you realize in the documentary that 
you know, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe yeah. that's letting go. Yeah. And then the screen fades to black as we listen to these recordings. Now, I assume that for those experiencing the documentary live, you know, their focus would shift to you. As soon as the screen goes black, yeah. you know, they would start watching you intently as they try to decipher if you have indeed let go, you know, if you're no that's, longer affected by the tapes. That's one. Am I right? Well, that's one place that's a little different in the live version. In the Boom. live version, I actually leave and just let it let the thing play and I'm not there. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Oh, it's like it's like the spinning top at the end of Inception. Let, <laughs> make them guess. Hell yeah. Oh, I I love that ambiguity. Oh, hell yeah. Okay, I, I, you know, I had a whole subsequent question, you know, <laughs> regarding how you answered this one, but uh, right. I, I feel like let's keep it ambiguous. Let's not All keep right. digging. And right. I respect that a lot. Hell yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, now I guess uh, the last thing I'll say is, um, in, you know, in regards to this last question that I asked yeah. is, I, I, I do have something to confess, and that is, you know, I have to thank you for. Because, you know, this film, 32 Sounds, inspired me to do something similar to what you did in this part of the movie. Uh, you know, years ago, my grandfather from my father's side was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and dementia. And growing up throughout my life, I always heard about, you know, the great stories of Alvaro Sa, you know, the great stories of my grandfather about, you know, his fishing trips and how he built our farm and how he fell in love with my grandma and, sure. you know, even stories of his kidnapping back in the 90s. Wow. Um, and then, you know, I, I had always heard bits and pieces, but I had never like sat down to hear the entire thing. And then during the pandemic, uh, you know, we were all forced, my whole family, I flew back to Colombia yeah. and we were all just like staying together in the farm with my grandfather. And back then, you know, his Alzheimer's and his dementia, it, it weren't that bad. You know, it, yeah. it was still, you know, pretty mild. So, you know, I figured there's, you know, there's not a better time than this. So I finally sure. sat down with him and I recorded a conversation where I asked him about, you know, as many of the stories as I could. Yeah. And ever since that day, back in 2020, I never listened to that recording. It has stayed in my computer, yeah, you know, in, in, in a little file hidden, but I, yeah. I never listened to it. And then... I finally listened to it after watching 32 Sounds. I, mm. you know, I felt inspired by your actions, and uh, I did. And so thank you for that. It, it really Straight. means a lot. Make sure you back that file up, too. Put it in a couple places. You don't want to lose do. it. That's like a very valuable thing. Good job in doing that. I mean, at a certain point, it'll be too late. All those stories will be gone in a way. So you'll you'll be happy in 20 years you have that. Yeah, it it was definitely um, interesting to to you know listen to his voice once again. Oh, I I forgot to mention, but yeah, he he passed away this summer. So oh, I didn't know that. Okay, uh, <laughs> that makes it even it, more poignant. It was a, it was a, it was a, it was a cool experience, and I'm I'm glad cool. I did. So thank you. Good. Your documentary really really touched me. Um, now I guess my next question is. Yep. You know, at the end of the credits, there is a note that states that your live documentary, 32 Sounds, was yep. inspired by a biopic directed by Francois Girard called 32 Short Films about Glenn Gold, which was in turn inspired by a musical piece composed by Johann Sebastian Bach called The Goldberg Variations. Yep. First of all, that is fascinating. Uh -huh. Second of all, my question is, what would you say is the through line that connects all three of this art pieces? You know, what uh -huh. do they have in common and what brings them together? That's, well, I'm, I was most inspired by 32 short films about Glenn Gould, which is a movie about the Canadian pianist, and it's a biopic you mentioned. But to me, biopics are my least favorite genre. I can't stand them because they're so formulaic. You know, it's always like starts with the scene, then flashes back to the person's life, then ends up back at this scene, you know, Johnny Cage, Johnny Cash, you know, that was a great movie and I like Joaquin Phoenix, but it's just the form is so tired, I think. And also, like, no lives. All of our lives are way too messy and complicated to fit into a three-act structure and its sort of narrative arc. So I love 32 Short Films of Black Glenn Gould. It's one of my favorite films because it's a portrait of the pianist in just bits and pieces and it's 
different scenes, Canadian documentary, different scenes. Um, some of them are animation, some are actors, some are documentary, and it's just delightful. You never know where it's going, but it, you know, it's a profound movie. So I thought when I'm making a movie about sound, I can't make the movie about sound. You know, I, I'm just going to make a, a subjective thing, you know, my feelings about sound, my thoughts, and all I can do is bits and pieces. So I like that as a form and an approach. And I also like that that 32, 32 was taken from this, you mentioned Goldberg Variations, which is Glenn Gould's signature work. And so it's it's not so much the Goldberg Variations themselves, but just the idea that art can reverberate through the ages. And that inspired Glenn Gould, that inspired the movie, that inspired me, and hopefully, you know, the, the reverberations will continue on. I like that idea because nobody thinks of anything, you know, from total scratch. You're, you're in dialogue with other people and other artists and the things you've seen and the things that have been like acknowledging that and being part of that. Sam, thank you so much for joining us today. This thank was you truly very amazing. Much. Are you going to come on to see the show? I really want to, and I wish I could, but uh, unfortunately, I'm also working as a venue manager at this year's Vancouver International Film Festival, so I'm afraid I will be working on the <laughs> 5th of worsting. October. All right. Well, but I, I will be thinking. You, that would be great because I like what you do, and I appreciate the time and the conversation. Yeah. Uh -huh.